Mr. Vladimir observed the forced expression of bewilderment on Verloc's face and smiled sarcastically. I see that you understand me perfectly. I dare say you are intelligent enough for your work. What we want now is activity. Activity. On repeating this last word, Mr. Vladimir laid a long white forefinger on the edge of the desk. Every trace of huskiness disappeared from Mr. Verloc's voice. The nape of his gross neck became crimson above the velvet collar of his overcoat. His lips quivered before they came widely open. If you'll only be good enough to look up my record, he boomed out in his great clear oratorical bass. You'll see I gave a warning only three months ago on the occasion of the Grand Duke Rumald's visit to Paris, which was telegraphed from here to the French police, and tut tut broke out Mr. Vladimir with a frowning grimace. The French police had no use for your warning. Don't roar like this. What the devil do you mean? With a note of proud humility, Mr. Verloc apologized for forgetting himself. His voice, famous for years at open-air meetings and at workmen's assemblies and large halls, had contributed, he said, to his reputation of a good and trustworthy comrade. It was, therefore, a part of his usefulness. It had inspired confidence in his principles. I was always put up to speak by the leaders at a critical moment, Mr. Burlock declared, with obvious satisfaction. There was no uproar above which he could not make himself heard, he added, and suddenly he made a demonstration. Allow me, he said, with lowered forehead. Without looking up, swiftly and ponderously, he crossed the room to one of the French windows, as if giving way to an uncontrollable impulse. He opened it a little. Mr. Vladimir, jumping up, amazed from the depths of the armchair, looked over his shoulder, and below, across the courtyard of the embassy, well beyond the open gate, could be seen the broad back of a policeman, watching idly the gorgeous preambulator of a wealthy baby being wheeled in state across the square. Constable, said Mr. Verloc, with no more effort than if he were whispering, and Mr. Vladimir burst into a laugh on seeing the policeman spin round as if prodded by a sharp instrument. Mr. Verloc shut the window quietly and returned to the middle of the room. With a voice like that, he said, putting on the husky conversational pedal, I was naturally trusted, and I knew what to say, too. Mr. Vladimir, arranging his cravat, observed him in the glass over the mantelpiece. I dare say you have the social revolutionary jargon by heart well enough, he said contemptuously. Voxet, you haven't ever studied Latin, have you? No, growled Mr. Verloc. You did not expect me to know it. I belong to the million. Who knows Latin? Only a few hundred imbeciles who aren't fit to take care of themselves. For some thirty seconds longer, Mr. Vladimir studied in the mirror the fleshy profile, the gross bulk of the man behind him, and at the same time he had the advantage of seeing his own face, clean-shaven, and round, rosy about the gills, and with the thin, sensitive lips formed exactly for the utterance of those delicate witticisms which had made him such a favorite in the very highest society. Then he turned and advanced into the room with such determination that the very ends of his quaintly old-fashioned bow necktie seemed to bristle with unspeakable menaces. The movement was so swift and fierce that Mr. Verloc, casting an oblique glance, quailed inwardly. Aha! You dare be impudent, Mr. Vladimir began, with an amazing guttural intonation, not only utterly un-English, but absolutely un-European, 
and startling even to Mr. Verloc's experience of cosmopolitan slums. You dare. Well, I am going to speak plain English to you. Voice won't do. We have no use for your voice. We don't want a voice. We want facts. Startling facts, damn you, he added with a sort of ferocious discretion right into Mr. Verloc's face. Don't you try to come over me with your hyperborean manners, Mr. Verloc defended himself huskily, looking at the carpet. At this, his interlocutor, smiling mockingly above the bristling bow of his necktie, switched the conversation into French. You give yourself for an agent provocateur. The proper business of an agent provocateur is to provoke. As far as I can judge from your record kept here, you have done nothing to earn your money for the last three years. Nothing, exclaimed Verloc, stirring not a limb and not raising his eyes, but with the note of sincere feeling in his tone. I have several times prevented what might have been. There is a proverb in this country which says prevention is better than cure, interrupted Mr. Vladimir, throwing himself into the armchair. It is stupid in a general way. There is no end to prevention, but it is characteristic. They dislike finality in this country. Don't you be too English. And in this particular instance, don't be absurd. The evil is already here. We don't want prevention. We want cure. He paused, turned to the desk, and turning over some papers lying there, spoke in a changed business-like tone without looking at Mr. Verloc. You know, of course, of the international conference assembled in Milan. Mr. Verloc intimated hoarsely that he was in the habit of reading the daily papers. To a further question, his answer was that, of course, he understood what he read. At this, Mr. Vladimir, smiling faintly at the documents he was still scanning, one after another, murmured, as long it is not written in Latin, I suppose. Or Chinese, added Mr. Verloc stolidly. Hmm, some of your revolutionary friends, effusions, are written in Sharabia. Every bit as incomprehensible as Chinese. Mr. Vladimir let fall disdainfully a gray sheet of printed matter. What are all these leaflets headed FP with a hammer, pen, and torch crossed. What does it mean, this FP? Mr. Verloc approached the imposing writing table. The future of the proletariat. It's a society, he explained, standing ponderously by the side of the armchair. Not anarchist in principle, but open to all shades of revolutionary opinion. Are you in it? One of the vice presidents, Mr. Verloc breathed out heavily, and the first secretary of the embassy raised his head to look at him. Then you ought to be ashamed of yourself, he said incisively. Isn't your society capable of anything else but printing this prophetic bosh and blunt type on this filthy paper, eh? Why don't you do something? Look here, I have this matter in hand now. And I tell you plainly that you will have to earn your money. The good old Stott Wartheim times are over. No work, no pay. Mr. Verloc felt a queer sensation of faintness in his stout legs. He stepped back one pace and blew his nose loudly. He was, in truth, startled and alarmed. The rusty London sunshine struggling clear of the London mist, shed a lukewarm brightness into the First Secretary's private room, and in the silence Mr. Verloc heard, against a window pane, the faint buzzing of a fly, his first fly of the year, heralding, better than any number of swallows, the approach of spring. The useless fussing of that tiny energetic organism 
affected unpleasantly this big man threatened in his indolence. In the pause, Mr. Vladimir formulated in his mind a series of disparaging remarks concerning Mr. Verloc's face and figure. The following was unexpectedly vulgar, heavy, and impudently unintelligent. He looked uncommonly like a master plumber to come present his bill. The first secretary of the embassy, from his occasional excursions into the field of American humor, had formed a special notion of that class of mechanic as the embodiment of fraudulent laziness and incompetence. This was then the famous and trusty secret agent, so secret that he was never designated otherwise but by the symbol Delta in the late Baron Stott Wartheim's official, semi-official, and confidential correspondence. The celebrated agent, Delta, whose warnings had the power to change the schemes and the dates of royal, imperial, grand ducal journeys, and sometimes caused them to be put off altogether. This fellow, and Mr. Vladimir, indulged mentally in an enormous and derisive fit of merriment, partly at his own astonishment, which he judged naive, but mostly at the expense of the universally regretted Baron Stott Wartheim. His late Excellency, whom the august favor of his imperial master had imposed as ambassador upon the several reluctant ministers of foreign affairs, had enjoyed in his lifetime a fame for an owlish, pessimistic gullibility. His Excellency had the social revolution on the brain. He imagined himself to be a diplomist set apart by a special dispensation to watch the end of diplomacy and pretty nearly the end of the world in a horrid democratic upheaval. His prophetic and doleful dispatches had been for years the joke of foreign offices. He was said to have exclaimed on his deathbed, visited by his imperial friend and master, Unhappy Europe, thou shalt perish by the moral insanity of thy children. He was fated to be the victim of the first humbugging rascal that came along, thought Mr. Vladimir, smiling vaguely at Mr. Verloc. You ought to venerate the memory of Baron Stott Wartenheim, he exclaimed suddenly. The lowered physiognomy of Mr. Verloc expressed a somber and weary annoyance. Permit me to observe to you, he said, that I came here because I was summoned by a peremptory letter. I have been here only twice before in the last eleven years, and certainly never at eleven in the morning. It isn't very wise to call me up like this. There is just a chance of being seen, and that would be no joke for me. Mr. Vladimir shrugged his shoulders. It would destroy my usefulness, continued the other hotly. That's your affair, murmured Mr. Vladimir with soft brutality. When you cease to be useful, you shall cease to be employed. Yes, right off, cut short, you shall. Mr. Vladimir, frowning, paused at a loss for a sufficiently idiomatic expression and instantly brightened up with a grin of beautiful white teeth. You shall be chucked, he brought out ferociously. Once more, Mr. Verloc had to react with all the force of his will against that sensation of faintness running down one's legs, which once upon a time had inspired some poor devil with the felicitous expression, my heart went down into my boots. Mr. Verloc, aware of the sensation, raised his head bravely. 
Mr. Vladimir bore the look of heavy inquiry with perfect serenity. What we want is to administer a tonic to the conference in Milan, he said airily. Its deliberations upon international action for the suppression of political crime don't seem to get anywhere. England lags. The country is absurd with its sentimental regard for individual liberty. It's intolerable to think that all your friends have got only to come over to. In that way, I have them all under my eye, Mr. Verloc interrupted huskily. It would be much more to the point to have them all under lock and key. England must be brought into line. The imbecile bourgeoisie of this country make themselves the accomplices of the very people whose aim is to drive them out of their houses to starve in ditches, and they have the political power still, if they only had the sense to use it for their preservation. I suppose you agree that the middle classes are stupid. Mr. Verloc agreed hoarsely. They are. They have no imagination. They are blinded by an idiotic vanity. What they want just now is a jolly good scare. This is the psychological moment to set your friends to work. I have had you called here to develop to you my idea. And Mr. Vladimir developed his idea from on high, with scorn and condescension displaying at the same time an amount of ignorance as to the real aims, thoughts, and methods of the revolutionary world which filled the silent Mr. Verloc with inward consternation. He confounded causes with effects more than was excusable. The most distinguished propagandists with impulsive bomb-throwers assumed organization where in the nature of things it could not exist, spoke of the Social Revolutionary Party one moment as of a perfectly disciplined army where the world of chiefs was supreme, and at another as if it had been the loosest association of desperate brigands that ever camped in a mountain gorge. Once Mr. Verloc had opened his mouth for a protest, but the raising of a shapely large white hand arrested him. Very soon he became too appalled to even try to protest. He listened in a stillness of dread which resembled the immobility of profound attention. A series of outrages, Mr. Vladimir continued calmly, executed here in this country. Not only planned here, that would not do. They would not mind. Your friends could set half the continent on fire without influencing the public opinion here in favor of a universal repressive legislation. They will not look outside their backyard here. Mr. Verloc cleared his throat, but his heart failed him, and he said nothing. These outrages need not be especially sanguinary, Mr. Vladimir went on, as if delivering a scientific lecture. But they must be sufficiently startling, effective. Let them be directed against buildings, for instance. What is the fetish of the hour that all the bourgeoisie recognize, eh, Mr. Verloc? Mr. Verloc opened his hands and shrugged his shoulders slightly. You're too lazy to think, was Vladimir's comment upon that gesture. Pay attention to what I say. The fetish of today is neither royalty nor religion. Therefore, the palace and the church should be left alone. You understand what I mean, Mr. Verloc? The dismay and the scorn of Mr. Verloc found vent in an attempt at levity. Perfectly, but what of the embassies? A series of attacks on the various embassies, he began, but he could not withstand the cold, watchful stare of the first secretary. You can be facetious, I see. 
the leader observed carelessly. That's all right. It may enliven your oratory at socialist congresses, but this room is no place for it. It would be infinitely safer for you to follow carefully what I am saying, as you are being called upon to furnish facts instead of cock-and-bull stories. You had better try to make your profit off what I am taking the trouble to explain to you. The sacrosanct fetish of today is science. Why don't you get some of your friends to go for that wooden-faced panjandrum, eh? Is it not part of these institutions which must be swept away before the FP comes along? Mr. Verloc said nothing. He was afraid to open his lips, lest a groan should escape him. This is what you should try for. An attempt upon a crowned head, or on a president, is sensational enough in a way, but not so much as it used to be. It has entered into the general conception of the existence of all chiefs of state. It's almost conventional, especially since so many presidents have been assassinated. Now let us take an outrage upon, say, a church. Horrible enough at first sight, no doubt, and yet not so effective as a person of an ordinary mind might think. No matter how revolutionary and anarchist in conception, there would be fools enough to give such an outrage the character of a religious manifestation, and that would detract from the especial alarming significance we wish to give to the act. A murderous attempt on a restaurant or a theater would suffer in the same way from the suggestion of non-political passion. The exasperation of a hungry man, an act of social revenge. All this is used up. It is no longer instructive as an object lesson in revolutionary anarchism. Every newspaper has ready-made phrases to explain such manifestations away. I am about to give you the philosophy of bomb-throwing from my point of view, from the point of view you pretend to have been serving for the last eleven years. I will try not to talk above your head. The sensibilities of the class you are attacking are soon blunted. Property seems to them an indestructible thing. You can't count upon their emotions either of pity or fear for very long. A bomb outrage to have any influence on public opinion now must go beyond the intention of vengeance or terrorism. It must be purely destructive. It must be that, and only that, beyond the faintest suspicion of any other kind. You anarchists should make it clear that you are perfectly determined to make a clean sweep of the whole social creation. But how to get that appallingly absurd notion into the heads of the middle classes so that there should be no mistake? That's the question. By directing your blows at something outside the ordinary passions of humanity is the answer. Of course, there is art. A bomb in the National Gallery would make some noise, but it would not be serious enough. Art has never been their fetish. It's like breaking a few back windows in a man's house. Whereas, if you want to make him really sit up, you must try at least to raise the roof. There would be some screaming, of course, but from whom? Artists, art critics, and such like. People of no account. Nobody minds what they say. But there is learning, science. Any imbecile that has got an income believes in that. He does not know why, but he believes it matters somehow. It is the sacrosanct fetish. All the damned professors are radicals at heart. Let them know their great pangendrum has got to go, too, to make room for the future of the proletariat. 
A howl from all these intellectual idiots is bound to help forward the labors of the Milan Conference. They will be writing to the papers. Their indignation would be above suspicion, no material interests being openly at stake, and it will alarm every selfishness of the class which should be impressed. They believe that in some mysterious way science is at the source of the material prosperity. They do, and the absurd ferocity of such a demonstration will affect them more profoundly than the mangling of a whole street or theater full of their own kind. To that last they can always say, oh, it's mere class hate. But what is one to say to an act of destructive ferocity so absurd as to be incomprehensible, inexplicable, almost unthinkable, in fact, mad? Madness alone is truly terrifying, inasmuch as you cannot placate it either by threats, persuasion, or bribes. Moreover, I am a civilized man. I would never dream of directing you to organize a mere butchery, even if I expected the best results from it. But I wouldn't expect from a butchery the result I want. Murder is always with us. It is almost an institution. The demonstration must be against learning, science. But not every science will do. The attack must have all the shocking senselessness of gratuitous blasphemy. Since bombs are your means of expression, it would be really telling if one could throw a bomb into pure mathematics. But that is impossible. I have been trying to educate you. I have expounded to you the higher philosophy of your usefulness and suggested to you some serviceable arguments. The practical application of my teaching interests you mostly. But from the moment I have undertaken to interview you, I have also given some attention to the practical aspect of the question. What do you think of having a go at astronomy?